And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. God is good, and all the time. Happy Sabbath, everyone. This is the day that Jesus made. This is the day that Jesus observed when he walked this earth as a human being. This is the day the disciples observed. This is the day that the apostle Paul observed. This is the day the early church observed, and this is the day that God has not changed. The Bible says in he, uh, James chapter 4, verse 12, there is one lawgiver, one. And the heavenly lawgiver said, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. An earthly ruler called Constantine, in 321 AD, he said, Sunday is a day of rest. There is one lawgiver, the Bible says. So anything different from the seventh day is the Sabbath, did not come from God. I say one more time. There is one lawgiver, James 4 verse 12, and that is the one who said on Mount Sinai, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I'm delighted to see you in God's house. It's already 20 or 17 minutes to 12. I'll keep it short and hopefully spiritually sweet, but I want to recognize anyone among us who is not a Seventh-day Adventist you are here for the very first time. May I see your hand? First time. Oh, please stand. Give us your names, please. My good brother, what's your name? Morgan. Brother Morgan, good to see you. Where are you from, Brother Morgan? Where? Where's that? Okay, in Virginia? All right. Thank you for coming, Brother Morgan. God bless you. Say amen for the brother. All right. Yes, my good brother. What's your name? Jermaine Harris. Jermaine Harris. Tremaine Harris. Tremaine, where are you from? South Carolina. God has good people in South Carolina. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Tremaine. God bless your life. Say amen for Tremaine. Amen. My lovely sister, what's your name? Wilhelmina Sister who? Wilhelmina Wilhelmina. Ah, Sister Wilhelmina, where are you from? Petersburg, oh, right here. Okay. Thank you for coming, my lovely sister. Say amen for God's daughter. Amen. amen. Yes, my sister. How are you? 
What? Say it again. Claudette Williams. Where are you from, Sister Williams? Where? Malovia. Never heard of it. But if you're from there, it must be a good place. <laughs> good to see you, my lovely sister. Say amen for the sister. Amen. What's the name of that place again? Midlovia. Yeah. 25 miles. This direction or this direction? Anyone. Anyone who works. Okay. Yes, my lovely sister. What's your name? Gail. Sister Gail. How are you? Good to see you. Tell us where you're from. Amelia from Virginia. All right. Say amen for our sister. Amen. Did I see someone else? Okay. Say amen for all our guests. Amen. Thank you very much for coming. I mean that genuinely. You could have spent your time somewhere else. You chose to be with us. May the Lord bless you for honoring us with your presence on his the holy day. All right. We have a special day today, and we want to move on with God's business. We want to make haste slowly. All of you look very nice. But the best dressed people are those who are preparing to get baptized. Can you say amen? amen? May God bless you for your right, intelligent decision that has pleased all heaven and all, well, all heaven. We're not sure it pleases all earth, but it pleases all heaven, and that's really all that counts. Before I get into the message, please make sure these are turned off. Let me check myself so I don't come across as being too hypocritical. All right, it's off. Favor number two, and the reason why I ask for these to turn off, we're in the presence of God. If your phone rings in the courtroom, the judge will not be pleased. And you may have a vacation behind bars. So please make sure these are turned off. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. How many of you have prayed that prayer for me this week? Ah, thank you. And may God bless you. I mean that. Because I need that spiritual help. A preacher in a pulpit is in desperate need of help. Are you following me? When Peter was in prison, the church prayed. And because the church prayed, the Lord brought him out. When Paul was in prison, the church did not pray the same way. And the Lord left him in prison. The Lord didn't leave him, the Lord left him in prison. Those are two different things. Are you with me? And Ella White explains, if the church had prayed for Paul... The way they prayed for Peter, God would have brought him out. Mm -hmm. It's important to pray for people. So please pray for this desperately weak man standing in the pulpit. Favor number two. Well, the reason why I ask you to pray is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I want to speak the words of God. Favor number three. Think. A sermon is not entertainment, where you sit and the preacher does all the work. Think. We're dealing with life and death. We're dealing with eternal issues. Use your mind. I've told you before, if people would think, there are a lot of things they would not do because they will realize this makes no sense and it's dangerous. And so think. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we bow before you, Father. We come to you. No one else can help us. As we bow in your presence, forgive us, dear God, if we have sinned against you. Give us a revelation of how unclean we are and how much we need the cleansing grace of Christ. Father, because you love us, Bless us. Bless us with your spirit. It's the greatest gift you can give, for he brings every other gift you possess. Open our minds to understand your word, Father. Have mercy on me, dear God. My heavy burden is to present the words of life, and I am flesh, and the words are eternal words. Help me, God. Possess my mind. Control my tongue. Give me the Christ-like attitude, Father so that while I speak boldly, I may speak knowing that I too am weak. Father, surround this place with angels, mighty angels, to keep the demons back off. Dear God, if anyone listening to me in this building or by the internet has come down with the coronavirus, in the name of Jesus, whose very name is health, 
Heal that person, dear God, or those persons. I ask you, Father, heal them. Why? Because the Bible says you delight in mercy, and healing is an act of mercy. So touch them, restore their health, and through that act of mercy, may they be drawn closer to your bosom. Bless this nation. Bless the leaders, dear God. Help them to make intelligent choices, choices that are advantageous to the gospel. And in all that they do, let them understand, Father, that righteousness exalteth a nation. A special blessing on all our visitors, dear God. Touch their lives in the areas of their needs, I pray, please. I offer this prayer with thanksgiving, asking you to bless our online audience as verily as you bless us. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our subject for this morning, some things to keep in mind. What did I say? And there are two major things I want to tell you this morning. Let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We read verse 30. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading verse 30. And I want you to read very, very carefully. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading verse 30. Do you have that? Read with me. But of him are ye in, who of God is made unto us, what? Wisdom, come on. Righteousness, come on. Sanctification and redemption. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. In other words, Christ is to us. List those four things. Wisdom, uh uh-huh. Righteousness, come on, sanctification, wisdom. Jesus Christ is our wisdom. It is not that Christ has wisdom. Christ is wisdom. Listen to what he says about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't say, I have the way, I have the truth, I have the life. He says, I am the way, I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. In John 8, chapter 12, he said, I am the light. Not I just have light. I am light. In other words, to have light. Finish my words. Listen again. I want you to think. Jesus says, I am the light. Are you with me? Now, in order to have light, what do you have to have? Jesus. Now, there are two kinds of light. Go to John chapter 1. John 1, there are two kinds of light. We must distinguish what kind of light we follow. John chapter 1, read with me verse 9 and think. John 1, reading verse 9. Do you have that? Read with me. What does it say? That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, what do you notice? That was what? The true light. Now, use that bright mind God gave you. If the Bible mentions a true light, what can you conclude? There's a false light. Now, let's look at that false light. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. Our subject, a few things to keep in mind. We just read, that was the true light. And God is telling us there is a false light. Let's look at a false light. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. I can still hear the pages turning. Have you found it? We are pressed for time, but we'll give you a couple more seconds. You have it now? Read with me. What does it say? And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Stop. Now, the light of Satan cannot be the light of God. If you agree, say Amen. We have two opposites. We have Christ. He's the light of the world. We have Satan. He comes across as an angel of light. We have to be able to discern which is the true light. And the only way to discern that is by the word of God. Studied and obeyed. Jesus Christ is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. 
Let's find another verse that strengthens 1 Corinthians 1.30. Let's go to Jeremiah 23. Let's read verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 are subject. A few things to keep in mind. Do you have Jeremiah? He's called a weeping prophet because the people did not listen to him. And we are no different today. If Christ came down again personally, people would still try to put him on a cross. Mm -hmm. This sinful nature is serious business. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Let me pray again. Dear God, continue to control me, I pray, for your glory and the blessing of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Jeremiah 23, 5. And a king shall reign and prosper, and he shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. You finish the verse. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called what? The Lord, our righteousness. The Bible says Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And we read that in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. He is our righteousness. He is our wisdom. Let's confirm wisdom by going to Colossians chapter 2, reading verse 3. Colossians 2 verse 3. It's already 5 to 12. How many of you have to rush off to work immediately after the service? All right. Colossians 2, reading verse 3. Do you have that? Not yet? I'll wait for you. Do you have it now? Speaking of Jesus, the Apostle Paul writes, read with me, in whom, come on, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and Knowledge, yes. So Christ is our wisdom, he's our knowledge, he's our righteousness, he's our sanctification, he is our redemption, he is our light, he is our life, he is our truth, he is the way. He is the good shepherd. Come on, say amen. amen. Christ is the good shepherd. Christ also says, I am the door. By me, the sheep enter go in and out and find pasture. Christ says, I am the door. I am the shepherd. I am the sacrificial lamb. I am the light. I am the truth. I am the way. I am wisdom. I am righteousness. I am sanctification. I am redemption. Let's find out something else about Jesus. Acts chapter 7, we we'll read from verse 47. Our subject, a few things to keep in mind. The book of Acts, you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke, that's right. No, not Paul. Good guess, but not Paul. Luke wrote two books, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. So volume one, volume two. Acts chapter seven, reading from verse 47. Stephen is delivering a powerful sermon. Powerful sermon got him killed, by the way, at the end of that chapter. Sometimes speaking truth will put you in trouble. But you must speak it nonetheless. Can you say amen? Because truth must be more valuable than life. Because truth is God. Verse 47 of Acts 7, Solomon built him a house. The temple at Jerusalem, Solomon built. David wanted to build it, but God said, no, let Solomon do it. By the way, not every good deed is your responsibility. Are you with me? You may want to do this. God says, no, not you. Let him do it. Are you following me? You may want to be head deacon. God says, no, not you. Let him do it. God has final choice. Can you say amen? amen. David wanted to do it. God said, not you. Him. And when God says that, submit to it. Solomon built him a house. Verse 48, how be it? The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. How do you build a house for God? How do you call this building God's house? It is really, but God wants us to understand how big he is. How be it? The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Verse 49, heaven is my what? Throne. Not just home, my throne. I sit on heaven. Are you with me? You sing an appeal. God sits on heaven. And earth is what? 
My footstool. Some of you in your houses, you probably have a footstool for your recliner. God puts his foot on the earth to rest his foot while he sits on the entire heaven. And you're building him a house? Do you understand the bigness of God? Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool, saith the Lord. What house shall ye build me, or what is the place of my rest? Verse, the, last verse, the next verse, hath not my hand made all these things? You know who that is? Jesus. Now, go to Hebrews 1. Let's read verse 3. Let's read from verse 1 of Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, reading verse 3, a few things to keep in mind. One minute to 12. Right now, all over the United States, there are people worshiping. May the Lord bless them and put his words in the mouth of the speakers who are addressing his beloved people. God loves obedient people. He loves everyone, but he has a special love for obedient people. He really does. He had 12 disciples who was closest to him or who were. Peter, James, and John were the closest. And among them, who was the closest? John. By the way, there are some people, God is closer to some people than he is to others. Is this microphone working? It is. <laughs> Listen to me again. God is closer to some people than he is to others. What book did I tell you? Hebrews chapter, reading from verse, verse 1. Let me pray again. Father, continue to be with me. Direct me. With my permission, direct me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Read with me. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Listen carefully now. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Keep going. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. The Bible says Jesus Christ, he upholds everything by the word of his power. Keep this in mind. When you and I breathe, in order for air to come in, a vacuum has to be created in the stomach. The diaphragm goes down, creating a vacuum. Now we think we're... It is a, the vacuum pulls in the air. That's what's happening. We depress the diaphragm and the vacuum created draws in the air. That is arranged by God. The air goes down, the windpipe goes into the various vessels, down to the alveoli, very small, and they're surrounded by very, very microscopic blood vessels where the oxygen goes from the lungs to the blood. From high concentration to low concentration. It's oxygen concentrated in the lungs, but the blood is bringing carbon dioxide, you see. And so the oxygen goes to where this little uh, oxygen, the carbon dioxide concentrated in the blood, moves into the lungs and we breathe it out. And this goes on, we don't even think. He upholds that process by the word of his power. Amen. Come on, more amens. Come on. Don't you realize you breathe because of Christ? <laughs> to see, the light enters the eye. Goes somewhere. Do you, know, do you realize you see with the back, you see with your brain? Not with this. Mm -hmm. If you struck at the back of your head, you can go blind. If you struck here, probably not. You struck back here. That's where you see. You go blind. Who preserves that? Jesus Christ. Now, listen to Hebrews 1 verse 3. Upholds all things. What do you understand by all things? How far is the sun from the earth? 93 million miles. Who keeps it at that distance? Jesus. Some of you look doubtful. Jesus. If the sun came any closer, we would be well-dressed French fries. Are you following me? That's what we were. It is Jesus who keeps the sun at the right distance from the earth. Now, how far is the moon from the earth? About 240,000 miles. If he came any closer, the tides will come right on in. But the Bible says that God has said to the wind, to the, to the waves, thus far, come on. 
and no further. Who keep you? Have you noticed waves on the beach? They come and they? Because the word of God says, thus far and no further. The waves don't go back because the beach is sloping. They go back because of the word of God. There's something called photosynthesis, one of the most fundamental chemical processes in all of nature. The leaves take sunlight, something else, produce sugars, and the byproduct they give off is oxygen, which you and I breathe. Who keeps that functioning? Jesus Christ. Now the Bible says, upholding all things. Someone wants to have a baby. The man and the woman come together. One cell starts to divide. Are you with me? Yeah. Then it divides. Who tells it to divide? Upholding all things. Talk to me. By the word of his power. Somebody say amen for Jesus. This is Jesus. He upholds the entire universe. You heard my voice. You didn't catch what I said. He upholds the entire universe. If that's clear, say amen. Now, having said that, listen now to what John 3.16, don't go there, just say, don't look, don't look. Just say it. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only... Stop. Take out only begotten son. Based on all we've said, let's say the verse again. For God so loved the world that he gave... Take out only begotten son. Take it out. For God so loved the world that he gave the creator. Mm -hmm. Don't look around and recommend medication for me. For God so loved the world that he gave the creator who happens to be his only begotten son. Are you with me? You need to understand. Here is something to keep in mind. Your savior is the creator. There are two creators. When Christ was on the earth, he was still, he was still creator. <laughs> In Mark chapter 4, when there was a storm, what was Christ doing? He slept as a human being. He was awake as God. Don't ask me to explain. Are you with me? He slept as a human being. He was awake of God. The Bible says, He that keepeth thee shall not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth thee shall neither slumber nor sleep. God doesn't sleep, but human beings sleep. Jesus slept as a human being. He was awake as God. When they ar aroused the human Jesus, he stood up and he spoke to what he had made. And he arose and rebuked the wind. You read Psalm 25, verse 18. He maketh his wind to blow, and the waters to flow. The wind is his. The sun rises in the morning. Matthew 5, verse 45. He maketh his sun to rise. For God so loved the world that he gave the creator. Now, when Christ was on the earth, he was the creator. There is no assistant creator. Are you following me? What I'm trying to tell you is that when God gave Jesus, he gave the creator. He gave the one who upholds what? The universe. What if he had sinned? Do you understand the risk the father took and Jesus took? What if the creator who upheld the entire universe had sinned? A few things to keep in mind. When God gave Christ, he gave everything. Go to Colossians 1. Let's read verse 16. Colossians 1, verse 16. Our subject, a few things to keep in mind. Keep this in mind. When God gave Christ, he gave, say it with me, everything which means the father had nothing left. When you and I go to the store, we whip out our wallets and we buy some organic Pringles. 
We give the man a dollar or the person, and what are we waiting for? Change. When God gave Christ, he said, keep the change. Everything is yours. I'm giving my son. Now, Colossians 1 verse 16. Read with me. For by him were all things created. Stop. Four times you'll run across all things in verse 16, 17. Let's read again. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All things. Now, look at verse, verse, uh, the end of verse 16. All things were created by him, come on, and for him, which means all things belong to Jesus. Go to John 16 quickly. John 16. A few things to keep in mind. Oh, it's 10 minutes after 12. May I have 10 minutes more? All right. Okay. What book did I say? What chapter? 16, reading verse 15. Do you have that? Read with me. All things that the Father hath are mine. <laughs> Stop. What did Jesus say? Anything God has is mine. Now, having said that, when God gave Jesus, God gave everything. He gave the creator of heaven and earth. He gave the one who keeps heaven and earth functioning. He, he's the one who's the source of life. What did Jesus say at the tomb of Lazarus? I am the resurrection. I am life. All life flows from Christ. Whether it's the life of an animal, the life of a tree, the life of human beings, all life flows from Christ. All vegetable life flows from Christ. All animal life, all marine life, all avian life, the birds, this is the one who came as a human being. Now when you receive Christ, you receive, come on, tell me, everything. This tells us two things. The goodness of God and the cost of sin. Sin is such a terrible thing, it required everything God had to deal with it. And we walk around talking about little sins. It was a little sin that caused Christ to die. Here's what I mean. If no one else had sinned after Adam, would Christ still have to die? Yes, for one sin. One sin put Christ on that cross. One sin cost God everything. A few things to keep in mind. When God gave Jesus, he gave everything. Now, what a revelation. Let's look at another thing to keep in mind. Revelation chapter 3, let's read verse 11. Revelation 3, verse 11. The last book of the Bible, written by John, that apostle who was so close to Christ. Do you have Revelation 3, verse 11? Let me pray again. God in heaven, continue to speak through me, Father. Let me not forget, I'm here for your glory, not mine. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Revelation 3, 11, read with me microscopically, closely. What does it say? Behold, I come quickly. Now, carefully, hold that fast which thou hast. Come on. That. Mm -hmm. Hold that fast. Now, if Jesus is wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, he's our knowledge, he's our light, he's our faith, he's our shepherd, he's our, he's our gate, he's, a, he's everything, then what is it we're supposed to hold fast? Jesus. The Bible says, and this is Jesus speaking, by the way, in his letter to the church in Philadelphia, hold that fast, hold on to me, that no man take thy crown. He didn't say hold that fast, that no animal take thy crown. 
Hold that fast that no person drives you from Jesus. And those persons who will drive you from Jesus are not in the world. Are you with me? Where are they? In the church. I am talking to myself. Nobody's listening. Jesus says, look, don't let anyone take what he's... Hold on to it. Go to Revelation 2. Revelation 2. Revelation 2. Read verse 25. What does that say? But that which ye have already, come on, hold fast, come on, till I come. Now, Revelation 2.25 says, hold it fast. Revelation 3.11 says, don't let any human being take it from you. It is not a demon that takes it from you. It is people. Who rebelled against God in heaven? A living being, an intelligent being. Who became an agent of Satan to tempt Adam? A human being. Who betrayed Christ? A human being. You see, God uses agents, and the devil uses agents. I've told you that before. A preacher is an agent of God, if he's an honest preacher. Are you following me? Now, God uses agents. The devil has his preachers, who tell you you don't need to obey God. Do whatever you like. The devil has his preachers who I've heard one preacher say, You're God. <laughs> he told the congregation, You're God. Remember, I told you sometimes I say to God when I watch preachers on TV, Lord, shut that man up. <laughs> and that was one occasion when I said, Father, can you not shut him up? But don't hurt him, but shut him up. He's telling people, You're God. No one can disturb you and distress you like a fellow believer. Not demons. Are you listening to me? Most people leave the church not because of demons. Because of other people. Mm -hmm. This one said that. This one backbiting me. This one did that. This one's always criticized. This one because we drive each other out of the church. Let me modify my words. We allow. Are you following me? No one can really drive you out of the church. You have to cooperate. A few things to keep in mind. Do not be an agent of the devil to discourage someone else. You're not listening. You're sitting there smiling, good-looking people, but you're not listening. Do not be an agent of the devil. Be an agent of of God. When I was in college, Oakwood College, long before any of you were born, I had a friend. We were always together. We were running buddies. He's pastoring now in South Africa. And we always caused trouble. <laughs> always teasing people. And we were members of a club, a student club on campus, made up of people from the Caribbean. And we caused so much trouble at those meetings. We teased people, we disrupted the meetings, we thought we were cool not knowing we were slightly satanic. <laughs> it got so bad that the meetings would start, sometimes we were late. And when we walked in, you can hear a groan. Oh, no. <laughs> Here they come. Oh, no. There was one fellow student, we would tease him all the time. One day, my friend and I were walking across campus, and we saw him way across campus. When he saw us, he ducked behind a bush. <laughs> and my friend said, I see you. I see you. He didn't want to be teased. He ducked behind the bush because he saw us coming. Now, what I'm saying to you, don't be the person who makes people duck behind the bush. Are you with me? Be the person who when people see you, they say, ah, my Sabbath is blessed. I'm so glad you came to church. Every time I see you, I feel better. Not depressed. Make up your mind to be an agent of blessing. Hmm? A few things to keep in mind. One, when God gave Christ, how much did he give? Everything. What did he have left? Nothing. I'll tell you something else. Sin is so bad, it left God with one option. One. Many years ago, I counseled in a medical school. 
and some undergraduates would come to get counseling to how to get into medical school. And they would apply to 10 medical schools. The first three would be the top schools, the middle four, the middle schools, the last three schools that are happy to have applicants. Are you with me? <laughs> Bottom of the round. They had 10 options. If the top school said no, then they can count on the middle schools or at least the lower level schools, not God. When sin occurred, God had one option, send the creed. If that didn't work, case closed. A few things to keep in mind. You must choose to be an agent of blessing. We have some people who are about to be born again symbolically. Choose to lift them up. Don't criticize everything they do. Hmm? If the shoe is blue and the other one is green, leave it alone. Encourage people. Build them up. Don't pull them down. The devil knows how fragile we are as human beings. Someone walks into the church, let's say a lady walked in with a hat, and you say, sister, that hat looks like an umbrella. Now the person is already depressed and ready to leave the church and Jesus. Now you say to that same person, oh, what a lovely dress. Where can I get one for my wife? The person's face lights up. The person feels immortal. The first thing. You have built someone up. What am I saying? Be an agent of blessing, not an agent of depression. When Christ was on the cross, he was looking out for other people. And I'm closing. On the cross, he looked out for others. He saw his mother with John. He said, son, behold thy mother. Woman, behold thy son. He arranged housing for his mother while he was, be he was nailed to the cross. Hmm? Thinking of others, even though he was suffering. This is the spirit of Jesus. There's never room for selfishness, not even in suffering. He heard the thief to the right. He said, Verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. He took care of someone he was saving while he was bleeding. He looked at the persons who put him on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. Let me tell you, he was looking out for others while he was suffering. The only thing Jesus asked for himself, he said, I'm thirsty. And he did not even get a glass of water. I'm thirsty. How do you deny water to a thirsty human being? He said, I'm thirsty. Got nothing. But he saved the thief on the right. He provided housing for his mother, and he prayed forgiveness for those who crucified him. He was blessing people in his suffering. Let me tell you something. When you're suffering and you try to help others, your suffering decreases. Mm -hmm. When you're suffering, focus on someone else. Your suffering will feel lighter. Suffering is not reason to be self-centered and self-focused. Woe is me. All the troubles of the world are on me. Forget you. Try to bless someone and your suffering will reduce. Be like your savior. Help people. Even though you're suffering. A few things to keep in mind. When God sent Jesus. Come on, tell me. He gave. How much did he have left? Nothing. How many options did he have? One. And he gave his, the creator, who is his son. And that creator tells us in Revelation 3.11, Behold, I come quickly. And it's even quicker now and closer. Hold that fast which thou hast. Let no man take thy crown. Amen. Don't let your husband take your crown. Or your wife. Or your rebellious children. Or don't let rebellious parents take your crown, sons and daughters. Hold on to it with determination. Say like Job, though he slay me, come on, yet will I trust him. Don't be like Peter, Lord, I will die for you. Five minutes later, he's cursing Christ or denying him. Hold on to what you have. Because if you let go Jesus, you've let go hope. You've let go eternal life. You've let go blessings. You've let go wisdom. You've let go righteousness. I'll repeat it, then I'll pray. A few things to keep in mind, too. The cost of salvation cost God 
Tell me everything. This is no joke. He had nothing left. When God sent his son, he sent the creator of heaven and earth. He said, the one who preserves your vision, who allows you to walk and talk, this is the one who came. He said, the one who keeps the sun the right distance from the earth, the moon the right distance from the earth. He said, the one who keeps the earth circling the sun in 365 and a quarter days, that is the one who came and died on that cross. Then he raised himself, conquering death. Jesus conquered death hell, sin, the grave, and Satan. And that victory is available to you through faith in Jesus Christ. A few things to keep in mind. No one will discourage you like those in the church. I condemn no one. I'm simply saying what's biblical. The church said, crucify him. The Roman said, let him go. In John chapter 7, the brothers of Jesus tried to get him to show off his powers. Go to Jerusalem and do miracles. His brothers tried to tempt him to show off. A disciple betrayed him. The eleven ran. People can either bless you or discourage you. You choose to be a blessing. Are you listening to me? How many of you will say, Father, let me be a blessing wherever I go. Can I see your right hand? Let me be a blessing, hands down. Let me discourage no one. How many will say with me, Father, thank you for sending the creator to die for me. Can I see your hand? Stand with me. Stand with me. I love Jesus. How many of you love Jesus? Say amen. amen. He is a nice person. God is a nice person. And when it comes to Jesus, I say he's a nice man because he's still human. He's God, but he kept human form when he went back to heaven. That's why Paul can say in Colossians 2 verse 9, 20 years after Jesus went back, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, Paul says, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is still a man. He's also God. As I love to say, before Christ came to die, the Godhead was made up of three spirits. Father, come on, Son, Holy Ghost. Now we have Father, Spirit, Holy Ghost, Spirit, Son, a human being. Ah, you didn't get it. There is a human being in the Godhead. That's how high Christ has lifted us. There is a human being in the Godhead. His name is Jesus, and he looks like us. Now, we're not God and human. We're just human. But Jesus is God and man, and he represents us. There is no angel in the Godhead. Mm -mm. We are represented in the Godhead by Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. We're about to have a baptism. Is there anyone listening to me? You've been here all week. You also need to make a decision to be baptized. You've not yet made it. You'd like to make it now. Or rebaptize because your life has not been. You see, some people think they're on a flat line. No, if you're not growing in Christ, you're doing this. Spiritually, there's no such thing as flatlining. You're either growing or you're declining. I met a pastor once who decided to get rebaptized, not because he committed a great crime, but he realized for years his life had been this way. Just declining, but a very nice man. And he requested of a conference to rebaptize him. They said, No, we can't do that. He said, No, this is a matter of my conscience. I want to be rebaptized. The president said, Let's baptize you at night. He said, No, 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 no. Baptize me in front of the church because there are members of the church who need to go through the same thing. Amen. Evangelism, page 375, paragraph 2. God calls for a decided reformation. And when a soul is truly reconverted, let that soul. Be rebaptized. There are some people who simply need to start all over with God. And this time, by His power, get it right. If there's someone who needs to make that decision for baptism, you've not yet made it, and you want to make it now, you'll be baptized at some other time. Is there such a person? You'll make that. I need to be baptized. I've not yet made the decision. 
or rebaptize, let me see that hand. You won't be included today at a future date. If, you, if that conviction comes to you after the service, let us know. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the few things among many you want us to keep in mind. The one who came and died is someone equal with yourself. The one who said, let there be light. The one who said to Abraham, from the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac. The one who said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The one who parted the Red Sea, that's the one who came to die, Father. The one who upholds heaven and earth at a large level and a microscopic level, he is the one who came to die. And while he was on this earth, he was still the creator. We thank you for the expensive gift of Jesus Christ. Thank you for taking that risk, dear God, because you love us so much. Ah, Father, forgive us for not valuing the gift of Jesus. We value sin sometimes more than Jesus. Forgive us, God, and change our sense of taste. Help us to fall more in love with Christ. And by faith, wrap our arms around him and never let him go. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice. Bless everyone in your presence, dear God. Help us also to keep in mind that we are to be a blessing to others, not a curse. Let not our presence depress people, but let our presence put a smile on the face of others because we are agents of the Father. Dear God, bless the baptismal service. Bless those who will be baptized. Remind them that you love them and you desire to work through them to bring others into your kingdom. Hear this humble prayer. When this day is over, let us look back and see how we have been blessed today and this week. Bless your people wherever they are worshiping you now, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say amen and amen. Please be seated. The service we're about to move into will pass very quickly. Please don't worry. We won't delay you. We're about to have a baptism, and uh, it is required by God. Jesus came to John in Matthew chapter 3. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Matthew 3.13. But let me pray again. Father, as we enter the baptismal phase of the service, be with us very, very personally, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You go to Matthew 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? G John is saying, look, you should baptize me. Why are you asking me to baptize you? Jesus answered and said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Baptism is an act of righteousness. The person who baptizes is performing an act of righteousness. The person who is baptized is accepting an act of righteousness. Jesus said, it is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. The Bible also tells us in Romans chapter 6 verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death. What we'll be saying as everyone goes down, this is the end of my past life. And you're coming up, verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, a new life. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, I believe it is 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So Christ is symbolically a robe. Baptism is the point at which you symbolically put on Jesus. But it's a robe that covers the heart, not just the skin. And so we'll ask the baptismal candidates to come forward. Are they different sides for the two? Okay, ladies only. Ladies on this side. But please gather right here first so we can have a word of prayer. Let's gather right. Ladies, you'll be going on this side. A deaconess should be there to direct you. Gentlemen, you'll be going on that side. But let's gather right here first. Come right to the front. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. There's no exception, Pastor, because there's a couple... Uh, the what? Harringtons are going to be baptized Oh, yes, they'll together. be together. Okay, right. yes, that's a couple. That's a different story. All right, <laughs> don't worry. Okay, but unless you're a couple, men on the left, ladies on the left, men on the right, but a couple is exempted. Church, say amen. amen. 
Amen. You're looking at people whom God values very highly. Mm -hmm. What they're about to go through, Jesus went through. And God shows his approval. In Matthew 3, verse 60 and 70, the Bible says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, Tell me, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. When God said that to Jesus, he said that to everyone who follows the example of Christ. And so, my brothers and sisters, by faith you must hear God say, these are my beloved children in whom I am. Well, please, let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this ceremony, which no doubt will inspire some who are watching. We thank you for the example of Jesus. He found it necessary to be baptized, and he called it an act of righteousness. Thank you for the word that moved upon their hearts, dear God. And let us who are watching and witnessing, Father, let us continue in prayer in our hearts that the Spirit of God may supervise every aspect of this blessed service. And let us recommit our lives to you as we observe. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen, amen. and amen. amen. All right, ladies to the left, the couple, you separate. Uh, gentlemen to the right. I would a deaconess take my sister to the left. And the couple goes where? The left. Oh, couple you to the left as well. Couple you to the left as well. All right. Yeah. Don't leave them alone. One deacon, two deaconesses, whatever. Make sure they have direction and they have support. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. I was baptized many years ago on a beach. I'll tell you about my mother's baptism. God works differently for different people. My mother, she's resting. I'll see her in the judgment if I'm faithful. She suffered from asthma mm -hmm. all her life that I can remember. And... Um, when she heard of the Advent truth and the seven-day Sabbath, she'd never heard of the Sabbath, never, all her adult life. She finally heard it. She was deeply convicted. When you're a child of God, you don't need to know everything. But when you hear truth, something happens in your heart. Are you following me? You just hear it, and you can't explain it, but it hits you. And when she heard about the Sabbath, it hit her. And she began looking for church. We found an Adventist church. We started attending. We got some Bible studies. Then she decided to be baptized. She was baptized in July many, many years ago. After her baptism, the asthma virtually disappeared. Now, I said God deals differently with different people, but after her, as a child, I would hear my mother wheezing. She'd close the bedroom door so she, we wouldn't see her. I'd hear her wheezing because asthma is a terrible thing. You're fighting for breath. Are you with me? You're fighting for, you can go days without food. Breath, something else. That's why God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, not a sandwich, the breath of life. And she would wheeze. As children, we could do nothing. Mm -hmm. When she came out of that water, a few weeks or months later, she realized she was no longer bothered to the same degree with asthma. Amen. The Lord blesses the obedient. Amen. He really does. And so I urge those of you not yet baptized, you've been convicted, make the decision. You see, Conviction is something that wears away. Mm. And as you wait and wait and wait, it becomes weaker and weaker until it goes. And once a conviction is gone, it is virtually dif it's difficult for that conviction to come back with the same power. That's why the Bible says today, today, if you'll hear his voice on television, what do the advertisers say? Call now. They never say call tomorrow. Am I right? Call now that you've just seen the product, call now. If you call within the next five minutes, we'll give you a house. Call now. That's what they tell you. And so if you're convicted, decide right now before you leave this church. Do we have the first candidate? We do. Uh, we are approaching our now, Pastor. Just one comment for the congregation. Yes. You know that before baptizing, we take vows. Yes. It is a procedural uh, element of our service. We are going to do this in the afternoon. They are being baptized by faith mm -hmm. at this moment. Amen? But we are going to take the vows as we are properly do, and also other elements of it, including accepting them as members of the church mm -hmm. community, if, that, if you so wish to do so. I would like to, at this moment to invite the Harringtons, please, to approach uh, the baptistry, if you can hear me. Please come. My Jesus. 
Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Sister Tamika, because freely you have decided to follow Jesus Christ, and you are also freely following Jesus Christ up until this point and moving forward in life, mm -hmm. as a minister of the gospel, mm -hmm. I baptize you in submission to the Father, mm -hmm. to the Son, mm -hmm. and to the Holy Ghost. Yes. Amen. 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 My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Brother Neville, you're expressing publicly your desire to be with the Lord, to live for Him, and be in heaven with Him. Because this is your desire, as a minister of the gospel, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I will follow thee, my Savior, wheresoever my Lord may be. Where thou goest, I will follow. Yes, my Lord, I'll follow thee. I will follow. Take your time, don't, don't rush. <laughs> Give me that hand. I will follow thee, my Savior, wheresoever my Lord may be. Where thou glowest, I will follow. Yes, my Lord. Oh. 